Hey everybody, it is Trags Mike Petralia back with the latest episode of Code Reds, the Cincinnati baseball podcast on the CLNS Media Network. And it is my sincere pleasure and honor to welcome Tommy Thrall of the Cincinnati Reds Radio Network here to Code Reds. Uh, Tommy, welcome and thank you for taking the time out. Yeah, appreciate it, Trags. Glad to be here. Well, um, I want some good news. I think uh, Reds Nation, Reds fan base wants some good news. It has been, uh, frankly, a brutal spring training uh, in terms of the injuries. A, a lot of fans, Tommy, I think you know this. You were on the caravan. You got really a good pulse of what Reds fans were feeling, the optimism they were feeling, and I think justifiably so, heading into the offseason. And then training camp hits, uh, spring training uh, hits, and all of a sudden, immediately, the Reds are dealing with injuries. You have Matt McLean uh, dealing with a sore oblique, a kind of different injury than last year. Uh, TJ Friedel, the fractured uh, left wrist, suffered on Saturday, diving for a ball against the Seattle Mariners. Uh, he's at least going to be out for a month. Uh, at least at that point, they'll reassess things, see where he's at. Um, and, you know, Matt McLean also uh, recently uh, during a team drill injured his left shoulder. That may be a day to day situation. And that's on top of everything else, uh, such as uh, Nick Lodolo coming back from a stress reaction. Um, and Graham Ashcraft, of course, had toe surgery uh, in the offseason. That's a lot for David Bell to process. Give us some good news. Yeah, I, I think the good news out of all that is the, the most you're looking at is a month. Um, you know, Matt McClain's day to day. Uh, it, it it feels bad because it all feels like it piled up in a matter of a short period of time. Uh, I, I think we were all hoping that Lodolo was going to be ready to start the season. Understandably so. Uh, but but he's going to be close. You know, I, I, I think it's better to be cautious with something like that, especially early in the year he's going to be back in the rotation in, in short order. So that's, that's good news. He's feeling great. He looks outstanding. So that's encouraging. Uh, Graham Ashcraft seems like he's fully back from the toe deal. That doesn't seem to be bothering him at all. Good. Um, I think that's good news. Uh, the McLean stuff, I think the, the oblique injuries seem to be behind him. That's I, I think when his side was hurting him earlier in camp, everybody kind of freaked out about that. Come to find out the 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 one this spring wasn't as bad as what was initially thought. Um so that one's all clear, good to go. Like you said, the shoulder thing, uh, for the time being seems day to day. If it stays that way and that's all it is, I, I think he'll be ready for opening day. Now, maybe the most alarming thing with regards to McLean is the fact that he doesn't have a hit yet in spring. Now, we talk about it all the time for good reason. Um, uh, the results don't matter, but at some point you'd like to see a guy get his timing down. I think sometimes it's a reflection that he just doesn't feel very good at the plate. That might be the case a little bit with Matt right now. I don't think he does feel good, but it'll click. And once it clicks, it'll happen quickly. So, um, David Bell said yesterday, he still feels like there's plenty of time left in the spring for him to get the at-bats that he needs, whether that's in game situations, uh, minor league games, you know, B game, stuff like that. So he'll get his reps in, which is good. And they still feel like he'll be ready for opening day. The, the TJ Friedel, that there's no way around that. That is, that is unfortunate right. news, but overall, I, I think you're looking at some guys that look really good. Ellie De La Cruz has looked awfully good this spring. Um, Stuart Fairchild, who's going to get a lot of the reps now in center field with the absence right. of TJ Friedel has looked tremendous. Will Benson's looked better in the outfield. Also he'll play some center field. Uh, the, the other thing that we came into spring training not knowing is how would Jonathan India handle the outfield first base situation? Well, uh, the outfield, I think, is, is both positions are still kind of a work in progress, but he's made the plays that he's needed to make and left. Um, and I think he's looked actually very comfortable at first base. So that that's encouraging to me, and he seems to be embracing that role. So those are some things to be excited about and encouraged about. You know, you mentioned Jonathan India, and I, I'm glad you brought him up. Tommy, because I think when I saw him in person on Sunday in the uh, Cactus League game against Cleveland, there was a moment where the ball uh, at the end of the first inning, uh, to end the first inning, Brandon Williamson on the mound, and we'll get to him in a second as well. 
Um, ball was hit right at him. He stopped in his tracks, read the ball, didn't panic, and made a nice catch. He also made a nice running catch on a Jose Ramirez fly ball down the line to end, I believe it was the fourth inning. Those little things, they're small details, Tommy, but you know better than anybody. You look for small details to see if the player is adjusting and comfortable. And then at the plate, I thought, saw India off uh, Emmanuel Class A uh, drive a, lo- a hard hit ball to right center for a single in the sixth inning, I believe it was. There are things with Jonathan India that reveal themselves to me that indicate I'm glad the Reds just didn't trade him away in the offseason. Yeah, I, I, and and I think there's still an element of leadership there that that he brings to the table. So, yeah, I, I'm really glad that, that the Reds didn't trade him away. I don't know that there was ever a whole lot of interest on the Reds' part to trade him. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's fair when Nick says that uh, Nick Crawl says he's going to listen to and entertain any offer. Um, As he should. Yeah, and that's 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 his whole stance. He'd be silly not to. Um you know, if, if somebody's going to offer you a crazy deal that you'd be uh, too, too, you know, silly to turn down, you got to you got to listen. So, but I don't I don't think there was ever a real desire to trade him from from what I understand. Now I, I could be wrong, but um, yeah, I, I'm I'm glad he's a red. Uh, I think he's going to embrace the role that he's in, and you know, as we as we always talk about, it's the old cliche: these things have a way of working themselves out. Jonathan India is going to get a lot of playing time because of this new role um, and because some spots have, have opened up as spring has moved along. Uh, you're going to see Candelario play a lot more third base now mm-hmm. um, with the absence of Marte for a month and a half. You're going to see, or I guess two and a half months, you're going to see India probably get some time at second base. I, I would, I, Ellie might even play some third base. Um, Encarnacion Strands played over there. That'll open up some spots as well at first base for India. There are going to be plenty of opportunities for Jonathan India to get his way into the lineup. Um, and, and I think he's proven, like you talked about, that the things that he's done, the, the adjustments that he's made, he's an athlete. And at the end of the day, he has gone out and proven that uh, you put him in a position, maybe he's not real comfortable, but his athleticism will take over and he'll get the job done. Maybe it won't be perfectly pretty, um, but but he'll get the job done. Right. I, I was encouraged, you're, you're talking about the specific situations in left field. I wanted to see different situations present themselves at first base. David and I talked about this about a week ago. Um, he hadn't had any real tough throws. Well, the other day he got a short hop throw um, and picked it clean. And you could just tell how fired up he was to be able to pick it clean over at first base. It felt right. good for him. He did it. And that was, that was encouraging. Uh, he, he's, seemingly always in the right position whether it's a ball to the outfield and a double cut situation uh, a ground ball hit to his right do you stay home do you go after it those are the things sometimes that a first baseman can get caught in between on but uh, he seems to be doing a really nice job with all of that right now safe to say if the national league didn't convert over to the designated hitter that jonathan india uh, would not be on this roster do you think that's Ooh. safe to say you know what I, that's a that's a really good point. Um, and it's not that he'll be DHing a lot. Uh, I, it's that other guys will DH. I, I, I don't see Jonathan DHing a ton. I would see Candelario DHing. Um, uh, probably Christian will DH some, I, w- right. I would imagine. Um, yeah, that's that's a really interesting thought. I don't think his role would fit the same. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. I think it would be a much um, a much different role for him. So... Yeah, I, I I hadn't really thought about that, but that's a very real possibility. Yeah, and I think Nick Crawl's done a, a terrific job building the roster and building his bench with that in mind and giving David Bell a lot of options. I want to get to David Bell. You brought him up, uh, brought his name up a couple of moments ago. If there is one manager that I think that can handle the stress of what the Reds are going through this spring training, it's David Bell. You're in the manager's office before every single game. You're in there uh, during training, uh, spring training. You get to really know David, have known him now for several years. What makes him so suitable to handle the stress that the Reds are going through and he's going through right now? Uh, he's just so mild-mannered. I, I think it's just his temperament. He he doesn't get too rattled. But not just that. Having grown up in this game, there's nothing that is going to surprise him. He's ready for everything. Right. You know, I mean, he, he's extremely prepared. He um, 
He's got a great staff around him that he trusts. They go through every scenario imaginable. So that way, when something comes up, they're ready for it. And I think that's a big part of what, what allows him to be in a situation where, where nothing faces him. He understands too, that you just kind of have to face these situations head on and he doesn't shy away from it. It's not like, oh man, you know, dwelling on, I, I can't believe this happened. Uh, I can't believe there's another injury. He, he, faces it, uh, deals with it head on and, and says, all right, let's move forward from here. And I think that's a great trait um, in a manager. And I, I I think that's what allows him to be successful. Nothing, like I said, nothing surprises him. He's got a great temperament and, and that's really kind of what it boils down to. And I think that's uh, the mark of a good manager. We started this podcast, Tommy, uh, talking about looking for silver linings, looking for some good news. I think a silver lining, if you want to look at it this way, is given all of the adversity that the Reds are facing right now this early and the season hasn't even begun, they're getting ready for the season, you make your way through this kind of adversity. To me, that really stacks up and really uh, you can put those kind of points in the bank later on when the team goes through rough spells during the course of a regular season. I, I agree, and I think it goes back to – the year nobody wants to talk about 2022 Two. they lost 100 games right that you now not everybody on this team in fact not many guys on this team were a part of that but there were some um and a lot of these guys were were in the organization that is a that is a tough thing to deal with well i think those types of things prepare you uh for for what's ahead i i think you know being in the race all year last year and not quite making it, finishing a game or two short. I think that helps prepare you for for what's ahead. I think everything that this team has gone through to this point has prepared them to be ready uh, for for what spring training has already thrown at them, and for what this season has to offer. I, it, it's it's crazy how much better you can get from adversity. If you don't get better from adversity, then then you're going backwards. I think there's also a lot to be said for that. Um, so I, that that. I think all, all of that leads to this team's pretty much prepared for whatever's going to happen to them. And uh, the, the, the biggest blow that they could be faced with, to, to be honest, and, and Jeff and I talked about this when spring training started, is losing TJ Friedel. Well, they've dealt with that before the season ever started. So um, that, that's that's a big blow just because they don't have really anybody – else that can play center field on right. an everyday basis now maybe Stuart Fairchild with the adjustments that he's made of the plate can prove to us that he can um but coming into camp didn't really think that 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 there was a good option out there on a regular basis so um they're gonna have to deal with that and it, it just prepares you for what lies ahead all right Hunter Green on to and you saw him live and in person on uh Tuesday not great. Uh, he gave up uh, seven earned runs, seven hits over four and a third innings, two walks. He did have six strikeouts, but just four and a third innings. And he was scheduled, Tommy, to go six innings. Where is he at as he readies himself to be one of the aces, if not the ace of the Reds pitching staff? Well, I, that um, he's got a long ways to go to be that um as far as a top of the rotation guy and uh, i think I'm that surprises people that you're saying that actually tommy I yeah think, and I um assumed in the off season this was the year they paid him his uh 54 million dollar contract they set him up to be the ace and i think they're expecting him to take that step forward yeah i think there was a lot of hope that that would happen and um right i mean it's not just hope it's a reasonable expectation you know he had a Pretty strong finish to the year last year after he came back from the injuries, fully healthy this year. Uh, it didn't really feel like there was any reason why he should take any steps backwards. But I go back to something that I say all the time. I have to remind myself all the time. I don't want to panic too much based on spring training results. Um, now, what we're seeing, a lot of balls over the heart of the plate, a lot of balls being hit very hard, and then – also lacking location at other times where he'll fall behind. I mean, a lot of deep pitch counts. It's it's stuff like that to me that's more concerning. If you're leaving a lot of pitches over the heart of the plate, okay, 
that's fine. You're just trying to throw strikes, get through your outing. You get knocked around a little bit, so be it. I think the 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 most troubling thing in my mind are the walks. I mean, he leads the team in walks, and they've made it a point yep. organizationally and staff wide to limit the walks. Well, he's still walking a lot of guys. So I think to me that is the most concerning point. But again, I go back to what I just said. It is spring training. So how worried should we be? I know he's working on a couple of new pitches. So is is that part of it? Um I, I think the concern goes up. He's probably going to have, I think he should have one more start in spring before the season begins. Right. If that start struggles like the last one, I, th I think then you, you, you have to be a little bit more concerned. Um, and then you, you have to kind of pay attention to his first couple of starts. Once the season gets going, maybe, maybe he does flip the switch and, and turn it on and, and, you know, crank it into high gear and, and he, he's ready to attack the season. But, uh, like you said, you want a guy to go six, he goes four and a third. That's that's tough because he's not getting the innings that that you want him to get to. So um, we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, but like I say, you, you you try to take the spring training results with a grain of salt, but it's certainly hard to ignore at the same time because those are the numbers that you have in front of you. I think Tommy and speaking with Tommy Thrall, the voice of the Cincinnati Reds. Tommy, what year is this, by the way? For this you? is uh, taking over for. A the legend, the icon. <laughs> this is my fifth since uh, that fella retired. Um, yeah, so Marty retired after the 2019 season. Um, so I took over for him in 2020. It's my sixth year overall because we worked together a little bit in that 2019 season. By the way, um, may I pay you the ultimate compliment? I think you've done a masterful job taking over, uh, filling shoes that not many people could fill. Look, I grew up following Marty and he was my idol. He was the reason I got into sports journalism. As a matter of fact, um, decided late in my uh, college career to do that, but he was a big reason why. So I should pay you that compliment here up front. Just want to let you know. I really appreciate that Trags. It's uh, it's been an honor to be trusted with, with such a task. Um, it's, it's incredible to be a part of this organization. Uh, I, I tell people all the time, and it, this is, this is a hundred percent true. When I, Got to know the uh, Reds family while I was working down in Pensacola with their AA affiliate. Everybody that came through that treated me really well, um, and, and it, it was better than the other organizations that I had I had worked with. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, I was like, man, I, I hope there's a day where I get a chance to be a part of that organization. Couldn't be more thrilled. And then on top of all that, uh, the the broadcasting legacy here in Cincinnati yes. is absolutely tremendous. It is incredibly humbling. And I, I pinch myself all the time and can't believe that I am a small part of, of such a wonderful legacy. It is indeed a legacy and you're on a legacy station. Uh, it really is, um, you know, something that I'm sure you appreciate very much. I want to real quick, get back uh, to what matters in spring training, and that is really health. I mean, like you said, the numbers are the numbers. You'd like them to be good, great, whatever, but you want health. And if this spring training has taught us anything, Tommy, it's you, you have to have healthy players. And right now the Reds are not in that position. But in terms of their rotation, uh, we look at Hunter Green. We believe he is healthy, ready to go. The hip from last year is not an issue. Frankie Montas, he's ready to go. Um, they're hoping he gets back to the 2021 form with the Oakland A's. Uh, what have your thoughts been on, real quick, on Frankie Montas? Who will be the opening day starter uh, March 28th against Washington? I've, I've been incredibly impressed with him. Not just watching him pitch, but talking to him, uh, his understanding of pitching, uh, his love of the game. He, he, you want to talk about leadership skills. He's got them all. I mean, he really knows how to relate to this team. Um, he's He's been a guy that uh, has been a great sounding board for a lot of the young pitchers. But then you watch him go out and pitch, and this guy gets it. I mean, he knows how to pitch. He 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 attacks the zone. He's aggressive. He throws strikes. Um, he's got a great pitch mix. Uh, and and it's not just that he has a lot of pitches; they're all pretty good. And he knows how to use them. He, he he's it's fun to talk with him because he's such a sponge, and he he's so passionate about pitching that he could just talk for hours about it. And great. Um, how to attack hitters. It's really, it's, it's so fun. And he, he, he'll tell you, he goes, I want to get guys out 
as early in the bat as possible. And I think that's huge. And I think that's a great lesson for a lot of young pitchers on the staff. You, you don't have to strike everybody out. In fact, you'll probably end up with more strikeouts the less you try to strike guys out. And I think Frankie understands that. So he he is going to be a huge addition. Um, I, I think he's really got a good chance to be a true top of the rotation type guy. And a true, um, you know, I think there's a lot of people that feel like the term ace is thrown around a lot. But he, he's got a true ability to be an anchor at the top of the rotation that that you know you're going through a tough stretch he's going to take the ball he's going to eat up some innings for you and he, he's going to right the ship when when things are going bad it happens to every team you've got to have the guy that can stop it he seems like he's the guy that can do it and he's got the mentality to do it I, I've, I've just been really impressed he had a couple of bad starts in the middle of camp but then you know he, he turned a corner his last time out and I think that's a little closer to what we saw his last start uh, to what he's capable of. He threw the ball well. He wanted to go back out, but they wanted to kind of scale him back before ramping him up for opening day. So um, been really impressed. Can't wait to see what he's got in store on opening day. I have a feeling it's going to be a fun start. And then Nick Lodolo, Andrew Abbott, and Nick Martinez. Uh, mm -hmm. Your thoughts on those three? And and obviously Lodolo, according to David Bell, was uh, scheduled to start the season on injured list and uh, – probably be ready maybe second third time through the rotation yeah april 9th or 10th that's that's what they're targeting uh david has said that he thinks best case scenario they could get him back april 9th that's when he's eligible to return because he was scheduled to pitch the day a game got rained out uh, he got pushed back a day and so they think that they'd have to rush him just a little bit to get him back so probably realistically april 10th will be the day that he comes back same thing for Ian Jabot. Not that we were talking too much about the bullpen, but Ian Jabot's another guy, which kind of creates some uh, challenges in the bullpen, but um, that might be for another day. Uh, but with the rest of the rotation, I, I think Lodolo is going to be full go once he returns, which is good. Um, and then I didn't, I never would have imagined saying this uh, when the Reds signed Nick Martinez. But he might be one of the most important guys in the rotation. Right I now. don't think there's any question about that, <laughs> uh, given how, you know, Brandon Williamson has is dealing with a sore left shoulder. Right. He's kind of roughed up on Sunday against Cleveland. Uh, and you take a look at, you know, Lodolo wasn't ready to begin the season. Pretty soon thereafter, he will be. Uh, but when you take a look at what the rotation has gone through and, and what the Reds are dealing with, Martinez being able to go between the bullpen and and slot into the rotation huge acquisition by nick crawl i think Potential well yeah anyway. and, and, and on top of that uh, i mean mike he's he's thrown better than anybody in camp he's been the most consistent pitcher in camp to this point great and his, not to interrupt you tommy but yeah. his rib issue is okay yeah everything seems to be good on that they, they the last time he threw he threw with no pain so i think he's scheduled to make his next start which will still keep him on track to be ready right. to start the season on time. So um, that's, that's really encouraging. I'm telling you, this guy has looked outstanding. He, he faced uh, the a lineup of the Dodgers the other day in a game that ended up getting rained out. They wiped all the stats. So you can't even find the stats from it anywhere, but he was perfect through four innings against a really good Dodger lineup that had everybody in it. So that, that spoke volumes to me. Um, and, and so he's looked really good. Andrew Abbott, I think he was kind of working on some things earlier in camp. I think now that we'll see him ramp up to opening day, we'll start to see a little bit more out of uh, what we expect to see from Andrew Abbott. So it, it, it's encouraging. I'm, I'm excited about the rotation. I talked about Ashcraft earlier. He looks fully healed from the toe injury. So uh, he hasn't looked great so far in spring. But He um, strikes me somebody, Tommy, as he's just working on crap throughout yeah. uh, spring training, working on his uh, command, his stuff, working on, you know, he's obviously working on a new pitch, uh, the splitty, um, split fingered fastball. He's trying to get, you know, something off speed, get them off that, you right. know, 98 mile an hour fastball. I think once the seat, once, once the season turns on, you're going to see bulldog Graham Ashcraft. I, I would like to think so. I almost kind of put him in the same category as Hunter Green right now, just because the results haven't been there and you yep. hope that once the season starts it clicks and uh, i think i think that's a, a fair thought for both of them um it, it seems like we almost worry a little bit more about hunter than maybe we do graham um and, and maybe that's because the expectations on hunter are a little higher but but i i think you can kind of put them both in the same category as 
let's not panic yet. Let's wait till the season starts and see. But um, I, I think Graham's stuff has looked pretty good this spring. Just the command hasn't quite been there yet. Right. And that's ex exactly what spring training is really all about. Right. This has been a treat, Tommy. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. Uh, an off day, I might add, right? You don't have any yeah. other obligations. So no, this uh, was it. This was, these were my big plans for today was to spend a uh, half hour, 45 <laughs> minutes with you. So this is it. Talk to no, I am, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to do. So the desert isn't my favorite place in the world, but uh, the weather here is, is great this time of the year. I'll probably do a little hiking yeah. later. So that's like great. That, uh, that's what's in store. Me <laughs> and uh, the missus went up to Sedona and, uh, did some walking around uh, in the mountains. I love the mountains. I miss oh, yeah. the water of spring training in Florida when I covered the Red Sox. I love the mountains. And when I went out there, uh, been out, as you know, I was out there twice, two different stints. But the second time, went up to Sedona uh, with Debbie, and it was tremendous. It really is something spectacular. Sedona feels like uh, a different country from Phoenix. It's pretty it's, much is. Yeah. It's, it's as long as you don't there. get caught in uh, snow or ice uh, storms coming down the highway, going up, going up and coming down 17, uh, you're fine. But uh, the views are just unlike anything you can see in this great country. Yeah, it's stunning. So it, it, that's that's a good place to go. Spent a weekend up there a couple of days or about a week ago, I guess. So that was great. Stick sticking around here today. Um, probably keep an eye on what's going on with the game, but I'm sure I'll find a hike. And then later tonight, the important stuff. Probably yeah. a big pickleball match with the Cowboy. If oh, I had to bet. well. Yeah. You were reading my mind, sir, because <laughs> my guest next week on Code Reds on the CLNS Media Network is none other than Jeff Brantley, the Cowboy. Uh, so I, I'm wondering, should I bring something up uh, regarding the pickleball? Absolutely. Him? Yeah. Oh, no. It, it consumes his life outside of baseball. So very much so. Yeah, you should definitely talk a little. That's a good little because. Pickleball. That's good, uh, Tommy, because uh, Debbie and I are big. Pick we're actually in a pickleball league, or going to join one this summer uh, down on the river riverfront. So I'm glad. See, I'm glad we I, I brought that up because now I have something to break the ice with Cowboy. Absolutely, no, he'll love he'll love it. it it's yep. it's uh, he probably likes talking about that as much as he does uh, baseball. So. Yeah. Well, he can certainly coach me up on that, um, and I'm <laughs> going to ask him to do so. Well, he is Tommy Thrall. He is the one and only play-by-play -play voice of the Cincinnati Reds on Reds on Radio. You can hear him, of course, on the flagship station of Cincinnati Reds Baseball, and it has been forever. 700 WLW, the big one. Tommy, want to thank you very much for uh, joining me on the Code Reds. Yeah, thanks for having me, Trax. Appreciate it. That's Tommy Thrall, voice of the Cincinnati Reds. I'm Mike Petralia Trags. Thanks for downloading this episode of Code Reds.